Thank you for tuning in and good evening. You're tuned in to Philly Cam Voices and I'm your host, Amanda Johnson. All of tonight's stories are contributing to the Broken in Philly project. With support from Broke in Philly, our producers participated in an eight-week solutions journalism fellowship to deepen their reporting skills. Tonight's story are the results of this work. Philly Cam is one of more than 20 news organizations in the city of Philadelphia, contributing to Broke in Philly. Yep. It is a collaboration reporting, Broke in Philly projects on economic mobility. One way of achieving economic mobility is through higher education. Reporter Connie Combe explores more about this program. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, there are approximately 400,000 Philadelphians living below the poverty line. Census data reports that about 30% of poor Philadelphians work in jobs such as cashiers, personal care aides, and laborers. A way out of the situation is through education. State Senator Vincent Hughes introduced Senate Bill 111 to make education free and affordable. So we came up with the, the whole idea of PA Promise, um, Senate Bill 111, and the first notion that it addresses is the whole notion, the idea of what's wrong with free college, what's wrong with a free education, right? uh, and basically says if, if you are uh, a student and your total family income is about $110,000 a year that you would be able to, to um, uh, get, get involved in a last dollar program. In other words, you get all the money from everywhere else you're supposed to get it from. You know, if you want a scholarship over here, if you traditional grant program, traditional loan programs over here, you get all of that, amass all of that, and then whatever is left will be free. So all of the publicly related colleges and universities in Pennsylvania will be covered in some fashion in the PA Promise program. And then we also do a thing on top of that for students who may want to go into the trades, who may want to go into apprenticeship programs or career and technical programs, CTE programs, um, that we provide financial support for them as well. I sat down with Susan Bond, the executive director of the Delaware County Career Links. She described how Career Links funds education for the unemployed. Um, each career link throughout the Commonwealth provides something called individual training accounts. And what that means is that people can come in, they need to follow a certain eligibility process, a suitability process, and they can apply for funding for certain training programs. In healthcare, manufacturing, transportation and logistics, technology, business financial services, construction and infrastructure, retail hospitality, and early childhood educations. These programs are important because there is a correlation between income and education. Uh, the statistic that's been around for a long time and I think has yet to be proven false, for every uh, level of degree that you get, you almost guaranteed about another million dollars in income on top of it. So uh, you get uh, high school, X, four-year undergraduate degree, X plus a million dollars. Uh, a master's degree or some kind of technical degree on top of that, another million dollars on top of, of that. What I've done is gone back and taken a look at a few positions and say, 
it's um, a health care. A home health care aide could be making 1046 an hour, 1047 an hour. And then if he or she goes into certified nursing assistant, it's 12, 13, 14. And then if they go into an LPN, it jumps into the 20s and they can end up as a nurse practitioner making six figures a year. But we know if somebody say has been a desktop technician and they go in and they get a certification in the IT field, their first paycheck out of school can be significantly higher. My work history journey has been a roller coaster ride. I started from making little to nothing, struggling to make ends meet, to doing really well for myself. It started from when CareerLink put me on to the School Network Learning Institute. It was that what gave me the advance I needed. Because back when I was making little to nothing, I was getting discouraged. I wasn't I wasn't feeling like I was going to ever do any better. You know, I think I had to take that leap of faith and to just let, let the nine to five go for a little bit. In terms of Senate Bill 111, here's what's being done to get it passed. What we're having in March of this year, uh, I think it's March 27th is the date. We're having a, a big rally here in Harrisburg. Folks will be coming from all across Pennsylvania to the state capitol to talk about the whole notion of free college. We've got to re-level the playing field. We've got to take back this notion of success that it's available to everybody and not just a handful of people who've got the money to make it work right. Here's how CareerLink's training can help those trying to break out of poverty. Um, the individual training accounts through the CareerLink are a fantastic opportunity to move yourself forward in a high priority occupation. The training programs are chosen because we think you'll get a job. Um, right here on the campus on April 10th, we're having a job and career fair here on the campus at 10 to 2, up in the STEM lobby. The big open lobby of the STEM building, typically it's 40 or so employers. I want to say if you're out there in the work world, you, I want, you know, don't ever give up. If you feel like you're never going to do any better, you're making not enough money to make ends meet, don't give up. Something good. If you put your mind to it, if you go out there and get the education that's required for the field that you're in, I want to say go for it. Take the time out to go for it. You know, t you know, take a leap of faith from the nine to five and come back after with your newfound education. I think you will do a lot better within your career and I think it will be well worth the wait. From personal accounts and research, you can see education does affect income and can lift people out of poverty. This is Connie Com for Philly Cam Voices. Hurricane Maria hit the islands of Puerto Rico, a territory of the United States, two years ago. As reporter uh, Yvonne Ortiz and Jesse Ortiz explains, people here in Philadelphia's Puerto Rican community immediately stepped up to help the evacuees. Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico on September 20th, 2017, leaving behind, according to a Harvard study, a death toll of over 4,000. Many Philadelphians were prompt to send their relatives in the island food and water, among other goods. Se creó una coalición que se llamó este Unidos Pa Puerto Rico en Filadelfia, compuesta por casi todas las agencias latinas. Se forma para bregar con la situación aguda de la recuperación inmediata. Ya entonces empezamos a confrontar la realidad de que hay una necesidad también de formar un mecanismo para ayudar a las personas más a largo plazo. Esa transición va a requerir la conexión ¿no? con, con los grupos que bregan con desastres. More than 5,000 Puerto Ricans came to Philadelphia. They came here because they have family and friends and also looking for a better living conditions. The Greater Philadelphia Long-Term Recovery Committee was formed. Reverend Lugo said they advertised it in radio, television, and newspapers. Ellos han sido como un agente catalizador, porque, okay, eh, hace falta eh, vivienda, y ellos se han movido en el sentido Exacto. de que cada familia que cualifique, pues, eventualmente se le ha conseguido vivienda. En ese grupo de, de personas que estaban ayudando y agencias, 
Pues he podido canalizar muchas situaciones. Un programa para financiero, para yo ya conseguir mi trabajo. Te puedo decir sin equivocarme que por lo menos el 85% de esa población ha logrado establecerse en la ciudad. De los que se quedaron, por supuesto, muchos se fueron a Carolina del Norte, unos se fueron a Florida, otros se fueron a Puerto Rico. Pero ese, ese, ese por ciento que se quedaron es bien alto. The committee held a press conference this past March 20th. Joseph De Feliz from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as Carl Jones, Disaster Coordinator for Southeastern Pennsylvania for the United Church of Christ, lauded the committee as an example to follow. As we um, transition, we also still have committees in place. The Spiritual and Emotional Care Committee is still really critical. And we're working on developing and institutionalizing some of the lessons learned. Reporting for Philly Cam Voices with co-producer Yvonne Ortiz, I am Jezebel Ortiz. There are many citizens of Philadelphia battling mental illness and homelessness. Reporter Toya Haynes and Randy Wells take a look at some of the solution agencies are providing. I was transient from October 2002 till February 2003. Um, I have a diagnosis of major depression and anxiety. And during the course of the months mentioned, I had, I had made some wrong decisions prior to that. And I got evicted from my apartment after living there six years. Philadelphia resident Maria Battiglieri is recalling a time in her life when difficulties with her mental health led to the loss of her apartment. The result was a several month struggle with homelessness. About 5,700 people are homeless in Philadelphia, according to the latest city data, and a quarter of them report struggling with mental health. The most difficult cases involve long-term unsheltered people with severe mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. You might see them and wonder how to help. But there are organizations employing evidence-based practices to get them off the street and moving toward a life of wellness. Liberty Resources coordinates support services for clients, internally referred to as consumers, with mental and physical disabilities. Norma Robertson Dabrowski, Nursing Home Transition Coordinator, describes the housing, medical, and casework support they provide for clients being released from nursing home treatment. Some of the barriers for someone with a mental illness is making sure they're taking their medication um, and making sure that they have the resource when they do transition out from the nursing home into the community. Outside of nursing care, the clients are highly vulnerable, but effective support can keep them from falling into homelessness. We make sure that they are connected with a case manager in the community and also making sure that they have a physician that's going to follow them in the community to help them with their mental illness. Studies conducted by researchers who focus on homelessness, such as Dennis Colhane, professor of social policy at the University of Penn, have shown that homeless persons with severe mental illness can be helped significantly and kept off the street with a permanent supportive housing relief strategy. This combines stable independent housing with caretakers and caseworkers who help provide medical and psychiatric care, substance abuse counseling, independent life skills training, job training, and more. Pathways to Housing Pennsylvania serves people who have been homeless for a year or longer and have been diagnosed with a severe mental illness or substance abuse issue. Well, so for us it is that we start with housing first. Um, and so we uh, will we'll meet somebody oftentimes on the street. Maybe it's in shelter or maybe it's in um, you know, some other sort of location. But uh, for them, it's all going to be defined by that person. Some people, maybe it's just that they need a little bit of support. They need an opportunity to reconnect and um, uh, reestablish what they, the, some of the patterns or some of the things that they had been doing previously. Others had been out for maybe decades or a really, really long time. And for them, we're starting at a much um, uh, 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 we're, we're starting really at the foundation. Attentive support staff is what enabled Maria to get back on her feet and return to stable housing. She now also works at Liberty Resources, advocating for persons with mental and physical disabilities. Um, I was able to work with my psychologist at the time and the social worker that was with the rehab hospital. And between the two gals, I was able to get an apartment 
where I stayed for from February 2003 till December 2007. Philadelphia's Office of Homeless Services currently endorses a housing first approach to serving persons who are chronically homeless in the city. Consistent and broadened services using this method show promise in helping a large portion of mentally ill homeless persons who deserve a life of safety, stability, and dignity. Housing is a basic human right. You don't have the capacity to be able to, to um, really work on anything else unless you have a safe, warm um, place to lay your head, to put your medications, to wake up the next morning and think about how can I keep working on my recovery um, unless, you have that, unless you have that key, unless you have that door. A new city program is helping homeowners make much needed repairs to their homes. As reporter Daryl Lloyd and Donald Terry explains, the program is helping to fight redlining and gentrification in Philadelphia's neighborhoods. A new city initiative, Restore, Repair, Renew, makes loans available to homeowners for repairs. Since the program was officially announced mid-March, the response has been enthusiastic. People have been so um, discouraged from applying to programs, thinking that, oh, it's just another one, I'll never get in, or I can't take part, it's for somebody else. And to have that number of people reach out to us is just incredible. We're so excited to have that many people contact us. It addresses the legacy of housing discrimination, like redlining and the current practices of gentrification, that have excluded people from getting loans in the past. There has been uh, a history in Philadelphia, unfortunately, of redlining. There have been studies released recently uh, demonstrating and showing where the disinvestment has happened, and that causes many things. I mean, even the reports showing if you live in a particular zip code, you are not likely to live as long as if you live in a different zip code. All of these do speak to that, and this program is but one part of an effort to try and correct some of that. Merriam-Webster's Law Dictionary defines redlining as a process where banks and other lending institutions would refuse to approve mortgages in certain neighborhoods or offer inferior rates to customers in others based on racial and or ethnic composition. It also refers to the illegal practice of refusing to offer credit or insurance in a particular community on a discriminatory basis. Certain neighborhoods are growing and um, the values of those homes are going up. Um, if you had no way to repair your home and everyone around you is fixing their homes and, and you know benefiting mm -hmm. from the neighborhood rising, um, this program will address it for those families. It will give them an avenue to get a loan to repair their home so they too will be part of the American dream. Their value is going to go up in their home. It allows them to send their child to college at some point because they might be able to use the equity in their home to pay for it, those types of things. Um, you know, They're going to be part of a neighborhood where the housing values are rising, and that's critical. Developers have been building new properties in many neighborhoods, often without homeowner input. Longtime homeowners are struggling to find resources to maintain their homes. Point Breeze resident Betty Buford is concerned about the rapid development. If it was done the proper way, I would feel much better. But the way it's being done right, this, right now, I don't appreciate it. Ms. Buford has needed repairs in her backyard. My back wall had fallen down and I needed, I needed repair. It collapsed like a domino. It didn't just fall, it collapsed. She looks forward to taking advantage of this new program for additional repairs needed on her home. We believe that there could be anywhere upwards towards 30,000 homes in Philadelphia that are in need of this loan program. It really allows people to preserve their most important a um, asset. Uh, many of these homes have been in families for generations. People leave them because they are you know, in ill repair or disrepair, and maybe somebody comes along and says, oh, I can give you a couple thousand dollars and it will allow you to get a new start someplace. This way we can let folks preserve what they have, create intergenerational wealth, and allow them to stay in their neighborhoods. And repairing 
one house on a block and then that house sort of helps prop up the other homes on the block and it creates a mixed income and an interesting community. Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods and this is just one way to help preserve that. And I think a critical piece of it again is, um, you know, the 580 credit score and the city originally was looking at a higher credit score and I think through, you know, some work we did in showing them the data um, around minority home um, individuals who come to us with lower credit scores that they would be keeping them out of this program if they kept that higher credit score. So they listened and they looked at the data and they understood that they needed to go lower, which is why the support services wrapped around that 580 credit score are so critical. Clarify is eager to help residents learn more. They can contact the program partners. Clarify is one of them. Uh, we have on our website a button where you can just fill out the information, uh, www.clarify.org backslash RRR, uh, or you can call in to 215-866-5200. With the renewal of Philadelphia neighborhoods, this program gives residents hope in retaining and strengthening the value of their homes and creating a legacy for their families. We're going to continue on the topic of housing. Joining me now is Angela McIver, a national leader of Chief, I'm sorry, Executive Officer at the Fair Housing Rights Center of Southeastern PA. Last year, she was elected to the board of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here today. It is a pleasure to have you. I am just ready to talk about the different changes and things that are going on. So talk to us about gentrification and what's going on in our neighborhoods. All right. Well, gentrification, as we know, is this pretty big word that's also packed with a big meaning. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's supposed to mean that we have people of different social backgrounds moving into an area. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, if someone comes from a higher economic background mm -hmm. and they're moving into a uh, lower level economic background and they're supposed to balance mm -hmm. things out. Unfortunately, that's not happening. Now, is gentrification specifically targeting the low income or how is that being affected in our neighborhood? Well, we're seeing it more dramatically play itself out in some of the lower income neighborhoods simply because it's a, a sudden change to the community. Mm -hmm. The face of the community is quite different. Frankly, we have people moving in that were coming from the suburbs, perhaps from different states. And I think the most uh, obvious difference is that we're seeing people from different racial backgrounds, wow. which can be you know, a great thing. We're supposed to be living in balanced and integrated communities. Mm -hmm. The problem is you have to work hard at achieving a balanced and integrated community. That's true. What are the major neighborhoods that, be, that are being affected? We see areas like Point Breeze in South Philadelphia, and uh, that's one of the biggest areas, or at least one of the ones that's been talked about the most. Certainly in West Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, and other parts of the city, mm -hmm. but uh, Point Breeze in particular because it was one of the areas that was featured in the reveal story about uh, the ways in which banks were lending conventional loans to white black and Hispanic applicants between uh, 2012 and 2016 mm -hmm. and unfortunately it showed that in the Point Breeze section of Philadelphia uh, black and Hispanic applicants were three times more likely not to receive a conventional loan compared to their white counterparts and this was even when the investigators controlled for nine factors not including credit or debt to income ratio. So there might be somebody watching say, well I'm renting. Does that really affect me? It could. It could because as we're seeing folks come into the community, and you know, Philadelphia has been named a number of times as the poorest large city in America. So, of course, I can see why there's a need to attract more people into Philadelphia that have higher incomes. Again, the goal is to try to create some sort of balance. But if you're not striving towards uh, controlling for those for that balance, then things can be thrown out of sync and that's exactly what we've seen happen. For example, um, the taxes go up and they have gone up and they've gone up significantly for certain people in different communities. In fact, taxes have gone up so high in certain communities, long-standing uh, people who've lived in communities for decades, even through white flight, who stayed 
have been uh, forced out of their homes because they can no longer afford the taxes. That's just one example of how gentrification has been affecting things. I think another thing that's important to take into consideration is the whole human relations element of gentrification. Mm -hmm. You can't assume that people from different backgrounds are going to suddenly find themselves in close proximity and all will be well. Again, you have to strive towards those things. Um, what groups are actively working to ensure that those differences are uh, being met in friendly ways and that differences are being addressed in friendly ways? I guess that's the key because some people may want to address it. It's like, but they're trying to be aggressive about it. It's like, mm, <laughs> you can get more flies with honey. Yes. So do you see that there's a higher eviction rate when it comes to these areas that are affected? We're seeing a massive eviction problem in Philadelphia. The uh, numbers that I have looked at, <coughs> pardon me, have been somewhere to the tune of 22,000 people annually being evicted in Philadelphia because we've had a pretty stable market for a long time. Now all of a sudden you have people moving in who can afford higher rents. And if housing providers want to take advantage of those higher rents, then they increase the rent. But if it's for someone whose paycheck has stayed the same, they can't afford the higher rent. Mm -hmm. So suddenly there's destabilization. And we're finding that African-American women in particular are being most harmed by this. And if women are being harmed, then if women have children, then the children are also being harmed. So if someone is just saying, okay, maybe I missed my rent this month and maybe that's why, because some people may not realize that they're being targeted. Oh. What are some of the recourses that they can take? Well, for one, know your rights. Know your rights as a tenant in Pennsylvania and know your fair housing rights. You have local, state, and federal fair housing rights. And uh, housing providers must also understand that they have obligations and requirements under the Pennsylvania tenant, landlord tenant right, uh, pardon me, landlord tenant act, as well as local, state, and federal fair housing laws. Uh, so all parties involved must be informed. And if a tenant is being targeted because of their race, then certainly they should complain about that. If they're being targeted because they're a person with a disability, they should complain about that. If they're being targeted because they have children, they should complain about that. If any of the protections appear to be a target, then a tenant should complain about that. Okay. Um, we also find that the majority of landlords were going to court with attorneys, while tenants were not going to landlord-tenant mm -hmm. court with attorneys. It's in a tenant's best interest to go with a legal representative because those representatives are able to work out agreements that oftentimes cannot be achieved without having legal representation present. So true. Last and final question before we wrap this up. Great information. Mm -hmm. So we have some elections coming up soon. What should we be expecting and asking of our candidates? We are 50 plus years out from civil rights laws that uh, were passed in this country in the 1960s. And I'm seeing that a lot of those rights that people achieved during the 60s are not being considered on a day-to-day -day basis. So our candidates, if they cannot talk the talk and, and walk the walk, then I think that we as voters need to be mindful of who's representing us. Uh, and it's more than just be able to say fair housing, fair lending, and that you're for those things, but we need to see it in public policy. We need to see that legislation is being promoted as well as has passed that's uh, ensuring that people's civil rights are not being uh, trounced upon in this election um, and even afterwards because it is one way in which the gentrification has occurred. Okay. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to talk about <laughs> Facebook. Oh, oh, yeah, that's another story for another time. So we thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you tune in to our Facebook, YouTube, and our Instagram, and we'll see you next time.